Welcome to the underground, the Steel City Underground, the black and gold standard for Pittsburgh Steelers coverage. Now, here are your hosts, Brian E. Roach and Zach Meckler. Eight seconds to go. Steelers down by three. Ben gets the snap, rolls right, he looks, he runs, he dives, in. he's in, he's in, he's in, he's got a touchdown, Ben has a touchdown, rolling right, what a play call at the goal line. Yeah, everybody, uh, welcome to another edition of the Steel City Underground podcast, Whoo! Uh, brought to you in part by uh, our friends at the Legends of Pittsburgh Cruise. Uh, get yourself an opportunity to cruise the seven seas, uh, or at least down to the Caribbean, uh, with a bunch of Steelers legends and uh, Pittsburgh legends. Uh, so, man, I got to catch my breath. I got my heart racing. I got to calm down, and hopefully, uh, you know, this will be the place to do it, or not. I, I really don't know at this point. But uh, yeah, uh, it's going to be a different podcast than we thought it was going to be forty minutes ago. Uh, my name is Brian Roach. I am the host who doesn't like toast, and I don't care what anybody says. And Joe Kuzma, who is down in Jacksonville right now, is unavailable for us today in the pre or post game. So, as always, when uh, needed, stepping to the plate uh, and filling in is uh, Zach Meckler, the pre- 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 bleh, the professor, uh, it, it, or whatever we've did. The, no, we can't call you the doctor of football, right? We're sticking with no. the professor <laughs> of football, right? Yeah, we're going to go with that, whether uh, a certain fan appreciates it or not. <laughs> That's right. Um, it, yeah, and I'm kind of in this mood, right? I'm kind of in the mood to just say, uh, you know, bad word to anybody. Uh, you know, <laughs> at this point, I'm like, you don't like it. Blankety There's blank you. So the Steelers, uh, I guess, shock everyone and managed to come back uh, from 16 to nothing to win in Jacksonville, twenty to sixteen. Um, what? Before we get heavily into the into the finish, let's. Uh, you know, huh, it was not a game that I think any of us felt like was going to end this way. At uh, you know, midway into the third quarter, right? I, if you did, I. I mean, you could have hope. You could definitely have been optimistic. But any person that was a realist is going to look at this game and think at halftime this game is over the way the Steelers were playing. Yeah, I mean, look, let's let's just look at the first half statistics real quick. Connor was 5 for 13. Ben was 8 of 19 for 53 yards. Had a quarterback rating of 10.1 with two picks. Um, no receiver had more than two receptions, and no receiver had more than 16 yards in receiving yards. If if we, you know, if you looked at those stats and, you know, you really, it does tell the tale of the first half, um, you know, of this game. I, I said in, uh, when I was talking to Trey uh, Johnson, I said, you know, I want to feel confident about this game, but I'm, I, I'm nervous about this game. Um, you know, I thought the Steelers were going to come down. I thought, well, I tweeted this out earlier. I thought there was one team that might have motivation to perform based on what happened last year. And then I said, unfortunately, I I guess it was the wrong team because the team that came out and played like uh, they had something to prove was the Jacksonville Jaguars. Oh, 100%. I, they, they came out there, and, you know, they still they were still going into this week were afloat in the AFC South. Um, you know, at that point, I think there were three games back behind the Colts, and this was really the game they could come out there and kind of prove that they – Hey, we're still here. We still have elite talent on this defense, even though Blake Bortles is Blake Bortles. You know, we still have a running back like Leonard Fournette finally coming back healthy. You know, they've proven that they can beat teams like the Patriots, like they did earlier this year. Um, you know, so having them come out here is a great opportunity for them to try to get that win. And they had every reason and everything to play for in this game. You know, I, I wouldn't have been surprised. You know, I picked the, the Jaguars to win. I'm pretty sure I'm the only person from SCU that. Uh, picked the Jaguars because I just felt that they had a lot riding on this game to kind of keep their season hopes alive and to prove that, hey, we're not going to go down softly this year. Um, and I thought this was going to be a great opportunity for them to try to come out and get that win for them. Uh, yeah, and they certainly – look, Jalen Ramsey uh, made did his best to back up his Ben is just me- mediocre commentary. 
Um, you know, they picked off Ben a couple times. Could have been worse if it wasn't for their own stupidity, um, quite frankly, with uh, the personal foul penalties. Boy, man, did they help the Steelers out a lot in this game with personal fouls. Um, just not smart play uh, from them. But let's, let's, let's look at this uh, drive chart for the Steelers. Uh, in their first, oh, nine drives, it went kind of like this. Punt, 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 interception, punt, interception, downs, punt, interception. <laughs> um, the longest drive out of any of those was seven plays. Uh, they, I, don't, I can't even count because I'm too tired to count this high, the number of three and outs they had. And... The saving grace of all this is that despite the fact that, you know, it looked like the Jaguars were chewing up ground and chewing up time on the clock, running the ball like crazy, the defense kept the Steelers in this game. 100%. You know, I, I'm not going to blame – if the Steelers would have lost this game today, I'm not blaming the defense. You know, realistically, after the uh, the first half, they were getting gashed, but – they weren't giving up huge chunks of yardage, honestly. Like in that in that big drive there, where the Jaguars held onto the ball for 11 minutes, um, you look at that. There was a, 11 straight plays of runs, and realistically, when you have a, a running back like Fournette that just pounds it, if he picks up three, four, five yards of carry on that, they're going to chop away at the yardage there. Like he still didn't rush for 100 yards in this game, and when it was all said and done, the Steelers only allowed 4.2 yards per carry, which isn't great by any means, but it's definitely not like it was. Last year in the first game when the Steelers played the Jaguars, where I think they averaged over five yards of care, if I'm not mistaken, um, total on the game. So realistically, the Steelers' defense did what they needed to do um, to kind of keep them in at least in the game. You know, when the score was nine nothing at halftime, all things considering, this should have been a much bigger gap. So I, I give a lot of credit to the Steelers' defense at that point in time when Blake Bortles was being forced to throw the ball; he couldn't do anything. So at that point, the Steelers' defense wasn't really the, the main focal point or a main issue I would have put on this team at that point. No, no, this is I, I tweeted that same thing out. Anybody who wants to blame the defense for this game uh, or wanted to put this on the defense was was not watching the game uh, because, you know, look, in the first quarter, the Steelers had the ball for three minutes and 41 seconds. The Jaguars had it for 11 minutes, and 19 seconds. In the second quarter, the Steelers had the ball for four minutes and four seconds. The Jaguars had it for 10 minutes and 56 seconds. That's crazy. Um, you, you know, you cannot, especially against a physical team, and that is what makes me nervous about the Jaguars when we play them, is they're us, right? They're a physical team. And anytime you play a physical team, there's a chance you can get out physical. You know, we'd like to think the Steelers are going to be the ones that are delivering out the, delivering the punishment, that are doling out that physicality. But these are all professional players, and they've got, you know, they've got their own egos, and they can play physical too, and that's how that team is built. They're designed around being a physical run, deep, uh, you know, team. Uh, uh, you know, try and run play action, uh, which didn't work at all today. But you know, it, it it's that's why they make me nervous. Not because they're better than the Steelers; they're not. Um, not because the Steelers can't defend against their run game. Clearly, it showed in the second half that they can. But, you know, you can get worn down, especially if your offense is doing three and out on almost every possession in the first half. Yeah, that's the thing. You know, you have to expect if the Steelers defense is going to have those type of long drives, you want the offense to come back on the field and put together a scoring drive at least to make it worth it. You know, whether it's a quick strike or whether it's another long, methodical drive like we've seen them put together in recent weeks, you have to have something going at that point in time. You can't go and have a, you know, a – 13 play drive that ends up in a field goal. Your defense does what they need to do. They bend, don't bring field, and then you go three and out the next drive and put the defense right back on there. Realistically, the Jaguars had the opportunity to put up a lot more points in this game than they did, considering the fact of how much they were on the field and how little the Steelers were moving the ball in the first half. You know, you're not doing yourself any favors on either side of the ball by doing that. And realistically, like I said, the Steelers were uh, were grateful, should be grateful to get away only down nine and a half time like they did. Absolutely. It was, it was an abysmal offense in the first half. Um, I'm not one to point fingers, but a lot of the stuff I put all I put a lot of it really on the core six, the offensive line and Ben in that first half. You know, I pointed out earlier in uh, in our back channels, you know, I like Matt Father, I like what he's been doing, but today really shows how fans cannot undervalue the presence of a guy like Marcus Gilbert on that right side. You know, he, the the D line of Jaguars was just getting in his face. Ben was making a lot of questionable decisions. 
and that leads to a lot of quick three and outs. That leads to a lot of interceptions that really not be made. Um, so there's only so much you can do. And then you put your defense back on the field. They're getting tired. No matter how conditioned you are, no one is designed to be on a football field for 22 minutes on defense trying to stop a physical downhill running back like Leonard Fournette. No one is designed like that. No matter, you know, the, the steel curtain of the 70s weren't designed for that type Absolutely. of stuff. So there's only so much you can do. Yeah, it, it was a game that – uh, you know, it turned around, and this is this is the way this game felt to me. The, you know, the 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 Steelers drive, they they throw an interception. Um, that in the third quarter, Ben throws another pick in the third quarter. Uh, that that cost them points, right? Uh, an interception in the end zone. Uh, then the the Jaguars take the the ball and drive down for their only touchdown of the game, and it, it kind of felt like at that point. If you're a Steelers fan, that's where you 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 were like, oh, this is do- they're done. But I I in my mind, the defense at that point said that's it, and it really kind of set things up for a legendary comeback. Uh, you know, a a thing of legend, uh, like the the Pittsburgh Legends cruise, the Legends of Pittsburgh cruise, right? Isn't that a great segue? That was a great segue. Our, one of our sponsors this year is the P- Legends of Pittsburgh Cruise. And this is a, a, a four-day cruise, five-day cruise that goes out and is filled with, you know, ex-players and Steelers legends, people like Juju Smith-Schuster, Rocky Blyer, Willie Parker, and Andy Russell, Antoine Randall L., Donnie Schell, Santonio Holmes, and even more guys. It gives you an opportunity to interact with them uh, and – and uh, you know, play some games, get some uh, FaceTime with them. Uh, there's opportunities for autographs that are organized. There's opportunities for other kinds of events, special things that you can sign up and do. Um, and it's all aboard uh, Royal Caribbean's newly renovated Mariner of the Seas, which is a 1,020-foot long vessel. It's a, it's a cruise into the Caribbean. So you know, it's, it's an opportunity to spend real time with these guys and if you haven't listened to the interview we did with Antoine Randall L last week go back and and listen to it because he'll tell you uh, about some of the really cool stories he has from these cruises and of course we here at uh, you know SCU want you to have an opportunity so if you use the code SCU19 uh, and go to uh, www.steelcityunderground backslash legends of uh, legends cruise on the website. You can get more information how you can potentially uh, get a discount on signing up for the cruise. You know, you can have a legendary time, just like what happened the rest of the way. Uh, you know, it was a game where I don't think at this point the Steelers could not afford to give up another point, and I think the defense said. That's it. We're not going to give up another point. They don't score again. I'm not sure they got another first down again. Um, the drives after that touchdown were punt, 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 fumble. Four straight three and outs. So they didn't get another first down again. And, you know, Mike Tomlin said in his postgame press, press conference that they didn't make any adjustments. They were making the exact same calls that they made in the first half. Guys were just executing better. I'm not going to buy that. It, it really looked to me like they knew – they finally got it through their heads. The Jaguars aren't going to throw the ball because Blake Bortles stinks. And <laughs> it's all this. <laughs> you know, it finally came clear. Okay, let's make sure they can't run because they tried. That's all they had to do. This is and, and in the past, and, and I, you know, look, Steelers Nation needs to take this into account. In past seasons, they couldn't have done this. They were not able to stop the run at times when teams were going to run the ball. That didn't happen today. You know, when they had to stop the run, they stopped the run. Um, You know, you give them a little – they're still playing kind of a wide-open defense in the first half. You know, there's going to be gaps. They have to protect against the pass. But they basically saved this game in the fourth quarter with those four three and outs, um, giving the Steelers' offense the ball opportunity after opportunity. And, again, just like keeping our defense on the field over and over again – that time of possession flipped. Steelers had the ball for nine minutes and 20 seconds to 540 in the fourth quarter. End result, <laughs> Steelers victory. Um, so <laughs> I can agree. It, 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 was, it was one of those games that definitely, uh, you know, makes you look for your nitroglycerin if you're old folks and you know what that's for, <laughs> or just say heart medicine. Um, 
And, you know, I want to talk about the individual performances now as we get through this. Um, first of all, you know, it's time to, to I guess, hand out our, our grown-ass man awards. And there, there was a point in time, I told you this before we started recording, there was a point in time I didn't think there were going to be any. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, the defense was playing well enough, and, and we're, I think it's late in the third quarter when we're, we've sort of not, we're not sure whether we've given up yet or not. In the back room, uh, you know, we're chatting in the back room and we're going, yeah, Javon Hargrave gets a grown-ass man award. Yeah, I guess Cam <laughs> gets one. And yeah, and then all of a sudden, oh, my God, Juju Smith-Schuster gets a grown-ass man award. Oh, my God, Vance McDonald is getting a grown-ass man award. And, and you know, all these things. And, you know, it, it definitely spiked up. Look, I, I will say this. This was Javon Hargrave's best game of the season, in my opinion. Um. He is definitely a grown ass man award winner. Two sacks, his first multi game sack game, I believe. Um, from the nose position, and there there was one play. Bortles eluded him, did a spin move, and it didn't end up positive. But it just showed you the quickness that this guy has. He just abused the Jaguars center um, and was in Blake Bortles' lap before he knew it. I mean, like you said, he spun away, uh, and that's going to happen with athletic quarterbacks. But I thought this was a great game for him. Um, Overall, he was disruptive, much more so than than I than I I think we've seen him be this season. And considering the a number of snaps Dan McCullers got and was not as effective as we would have liked him to be, uh, that was much needed. I'll even take it a step further. I think this might have been the best game of his career so far through the first two and a half years he's been in the NFL. You know, from a Pass standpoint, you know, there were the two sacks there, but even when he wasn't getting to Blake Bortles, he was collapsing the pocket. He was being a complete nightmare for the interior offensive line. And on those runs, too, he was either stuffing the line, you know, taking up two blocks like he's a stocky, stout man, um, grown-ass man. You know, he's getting down there and doing what he needs to do and holding the line up. Um, but even then, when he was eating those blocks up, there were a couple times where the lane would open up and there was a lane to fill by the backers, and either they didn't get to that point or Leonard Fournette or Carlos Hyde or TJ Yeldon or Blake Bortles, whomever was deciding to run the ball that play, um, was spinning out of it. But he did his part at that point, which is not getting pushed off the line. He's hunkering down and holding the holding firm at the point of attack. It takes a lot to do that, especially against a physical offense like the Jaguars have up front. Um, you know, last year, I think the biggest issue that was really seen with the two losses the Steelers had to the Jaguars was they were getting beat in the trenches, especially yeah. on defense. Um, you know, I remember I remember Cam Hayward coming out after the game last in back in January saying about how they were just out manhandled and they were. I didn't see that today. I thought there was a little glimpse of it in the first half. Um, but they really hunkered down. There was a huge attitude shift as time went along. I think a lot of that started in the interior, down in the trenches, in the grittiness of everything going on with uh, Javon Hargrave. You know, he really lived up to his uh grave digger um uh, nickname today, and it was a really nice performance by him and you kind of put together everything that made him such a tantalizing prospect for the Steelers. His ability to collapse the pocket, hold firm, and rush the passer. It was fantastic. Uh, not only did he live up to that nickname, he lived up to his Jay Wobble nickname, too, because right. Weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. And, <laughs> and, and, and as, as uh, I guess it might have been Romo uh, who said, you know, he has a wiggle to him. And, and on that one play I was talking about, he, he gave him that wiggle, that Jay Wobble wiggle. And just blew right by him. So J J Javon Hargrave definitely uh, deserving of a grown ass man award. I'm giving one to Cam Hayward as well because he only got to Bortles technically once, but he had his hand on him multiple times. Um, he was blowing past uh, you know their offensive line, especially in the second half. Stout on the run defense in the second half. You know I I, I have to give him credit. Uh, you know Tyson Alualu, I think got taken advantage of a little bit in the first half. Um, but you know, I, I can't put a lot of blame on him. I know that the announcers were calling out how badly they were missing stuff onto it, and of course they're going to miss stuff onto it. But man, that the other side of that line was definitely uh, Cam Hett was doing a great job. So I'm going to give him a, a grown ass man award as well. You got anybody? I got one more on defense. But do you have anybody else on defense you want to go with? Yeah, I'm going to give one to a guy that um, I think has really kind of been undervalued for what he's done this year, and I think that's Sean Davis. Um, he he's, he's, hasn't been, you know, a rangy free safety like an Ed Reed or like a uh, Earl Thomas, um, but there's a lot of times this season, and today in particular, where there could have been a much 
bigger run by a guy like Leonard Fournette. And you see Sean Davis hold his ground, come up, make a form tackle, and just stop the play. And Leonard Fournette's a quick dude. He's a big guy. That's a lot. Of, and when he gets ahead of steam coming down, I mean, we saw what he did last year to the Steelers and how he get to that second level, puts an arm out, puts the shoulder down, just barrels over you. You know, Sean Davis stood there and held his own. And I, I don't think Sean Davis is getting quite the – amount of appreciation as he should be for this, his play this year. I think him moving to free safety, I thought that was a move the Steelers should have done two years ago when he was a rookie. Um, but right now it's really kind of paying dividends, and I think he's been very overlooked. And there was a couple plays where he completely just came up and upended uh, Leonard Fournette. And like I said, that's a lot of man coming at a downhill pace. I think he deserves a grown-ass man award. I think he deserves a lot more praise than he is getting um, because he is he has let up or he's prevented a lot of big plays from happening. Um, that we don't really pay attention to. Because when a big run comes up and you see Leonard Fournette coming through the middle, everyone's just so quick to blame the D-line and linebackers for letting it happen, but no one looks at him for actually stopping it from getting worse. Um, I think that's something that I really have been impressed with with him this year, and I think today really um, prevented a lot of bigger plays from taking place that could have potentially have buried the Steelers early on. I, yeah, I, I actually agree. I think I actually wrote him up. Um, because for those who don't know, we do, we talk about it on the podcast and then I do a grown ass man awards article on the website. And I think I wrote him up last week specifically, uh, because we don't always call him out. And it's partly because as you said, yeah, he goes unnoticed because we're not calling his name out as in, Oh, Sean Davis made a huge mistake there. And that often happens with DBs, but you're absolutely right. I think he's, he's, he's had a really good season. Um, maybe, you know, Pro Bowl level season uh, at at this point, it's 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 consistently getting that way, where they have that safety gap that they didn't feel like they had when somebody else was playing free safety, um, and it's partly because Mike Mitchell is really a box safety. He he should never have been playing free safety. Oh, <laughs> okay, so I lied. I got two more. Uh, I'm giving one to T.J. Watt because it, when you get a multiple sack game, you should be a grown ass man. So T.J. Watt is a grown ass man. Um, you know, not only that, but he also had the forced fumble. Uh, if not one, maybe even two. I don't know who got the last forced fumble on um, Blake Bortles at the end of the game because they did. Him, call. I'm, pretty sure, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure he had two of them there. Yeah, and you know, so that's a heck of a yeah. It was yeah, two forced fumbles, two forced fumbles, two sacks. You get to be a grown ass man. Um, but then the other one, and I, you know, I. I know that there are a lot of guys who are not big fans of of this particular individual but he had a game today um and that's Vince Williams Vince Williams got a sack but the reason I'm giving him a grown-ass man award is just for what you were talking about a second ago when you've got Leonard Fournette coming downhill at speed that is a big man and late in the game when the Steelers desperately needed to stop Vince Williams blew Leonard Fournette up (laughs) <laughs> and he, instead of, you know, oh, Leonard Fournette, they talk about it all the time. He's a guy that always goes forward. His pile always leans forward. Not on that play, it didn't. <laughs> and that makes you a grown-ass man. So, you know, uh, as as we said, didn't look like the offense was going to have any grown-ass man playing today. Um, but I'm going to let you start this off. I, we do have some, I think. Yeah, I think the uh, the obvious choice for me is Juju Smith-Schuster, and I don't think it's that he did anything that was really kind of over the top. You know, there wasn't a uh, Vontez Burfecht type of layout, but some of those catches he made, you know, Jalen Ramsey was on him like a fly on crap, and now you thought he was going to come down there and miss it, and those hands were vice grips coming down on some of the balls. You know, he every single time it felt like he was making a combated catch, and he was coming down with it when he any other receiver on the team – minus an AB would have easily have been disrupted on the pass. So seeing him do that in some pivotal moments, no less, you know, especially down the, the down the stretch in that fourth quarter, um, if he doesn't make those receptions. It's an entirely different ball game. Um, so having him do that was absolutely incredible. And he, I think deserves a grown ass man award for his uh, performance there. Absolutely. I, 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 I just was like, oh my goodness, the, the, the one catch where he went up and, and got it and landed. not The first over-the-shoulder catch that Ben threw to him, which was a classic Antonio Brown-type throw, um, you know, that, that's the normal connection between Ben and A.B., you know, that, that over-the-shoulder, back-shoulder kind of throw. And, mm-hmm. and, he, and, and Ram, you cannot take it away. Look, Jalen Ramsey is a really good all-pro-level corner, and he was all over him, but Smith-Schuster took the ball. I mean, he just said, nope. Thank you very much. I got it. And then the the second time where, again, big plays that were needed. Um, 
you know, I, I may as well cover this because we talked about what the first half statistics look like. Let, let's look at what it ended up with. You know, James Conner didn't have an opportunity to do much running in this game, 9 of 25. Uh, but that's not surprising considering how the game unraveled. Uh, but Ben ended up 27 of 47 for 314 yards, two TDs, the three interceptions. Um, he was sacked twice. Again, when you if you take out what he did in the first half and just deal with those, and quite honestly, pretty much that's mostly what fourth quarter statistics. <laughs> um, that's that's a hell of a game at in, in the second half. He he definitely turned it around. Uh, Juju had ten receptions for 104 yards. Uh, or excuse me, eight receptions for 104 yards on 10 targets. Uh, Antonio Brown had five for 117 on 13. Of course, he had the one for 78. Uh, that, that was the ma- mass majority of that. Vance McDonald had a touchdown catch. And, I, and I'm going to give Vance a grown-ass man award for that catch because that um, – if, when you remember the Leonard Fournette touchdown, right, where – and I tweeted, Leonard Fournette just literally flew five yards in the air – because he did that, you know, he's, he's a big, strong guy and he got those legs to launch him five yards over the Steelers defensive line and into the end zone. And I said, that's, there you go. You believe a man can fly. Vance McDonald simply said, I can fly too. <laughs> and he went up to get a ball that Ben threw in the only place he could put it. Cause he made sure Vance McDonald is the only guy who can get it. So definitely. He is a grown ass man. Um, you know, he's been kind of a grown ass man all year. I wish they would find a way to get him even more involved, but you know what? Take what you can get. Um, I'm going to get one more uh, on this, and that is going to be um, uh, Antonio Brown. Um, not because of the 78 yard touchdown, but because he, this is, it's, it's almost the Antonio Brown is a mature ass man. <laughs> award. Not just a grown ass man, but a, because look, Jalen Ramsey was on him, uh, as you said, like a fly on, on poo. And he was getting very frustrated throughout the game and he kept it together. There was no incident of, you know, the Gatorade uh, cooler going over. And when they needed him, there he was that, that play late in the game might've been the fourth down play. I can't really remember. They, they got to get a first down. The game's over if not. And there's Ben to AB over the top of Jalen Ramsey for a first down. Grown-ass man kind of stuff. <laughs> I, I, there, there is one more that we both know is, should be included. I'm going to let you do it, though. Yeah, I mean, for everything that happened at the end of the game, I mean, for me, uh, Ben deserves to be on that list. You know, he um, was not <laughs> – I'm going to say it's as – Plainly, as I put, was not a good first half for him. I, I was getting PTSD watching um, this first half, seeing those interceptions, seeing that he got some pressure and was just throwing the ball where he needed to be. Um, but at the end of that game, you know, he became a man possessed. He was a lot more efficient with the football. And that, that touch, the touchdown winning dive, I mean, he just put his body on the line there. There was a broken shovel pass. Um, I think everyone saw that shovel pass coming because I think that's probably one of the Steelers' most common short yardage plays from the one yard line in that we've seen over the last two seasons. So I think it wasn't really that hard to identify. Um, seeing him go there, lay himself out, game on the line, to reach over and just get the tip of the football across to win the game when you have a guy like Miles Jack coming up and just destroying your lower body to get you there, that's a that's a grown-ass man. I mean, that's just Ben being Ben. Um, never have I ever seen a player that – can go from being one of the most hated men in Pittsburgh to being one of the most adored men in Pittsburgh in the matter of uh, a football quarter. Um, so seeing that, I mean, I think it, it, it won't be forgotten, his game, how he played earlier in the, uh, the game today, but realistically, even by the end of the game, he, he was the hero that the Steelers needed, and he uh, is a grown-ass man in my eyes. Oh, yeah, and I agree. I mean, look, you can't – they said that Ben had to put the game on his shoulders at the end of the game to win that game. And that is, in many instances, is what he did. There was more than one instance of Ben being Ben, and not just Ben being new Ben, but Ben being old Ben, the guy who avoids, uh, you know, magically avoids getting sacked and then comes back to find an open receiver. Uh, I know he did it once with Juju, you know, and, and he got – he got lit up a little bit uh, at times. The, this was not the offensive line's best game, as you said earlier. 
Um, so, you know, to take the punishment that he took, uh, he, he was harassed, you know, and that's what happens. Look, when they know you're going to throw the ball every down, <laughs> they could pin their ears back and come for you. And, and he, and he was there, uh, you know, standing tall, doing what he had to do. And look, you know, it, it is sometimes painful to watch Ben run the ball, <laughs> you know, and, and that, that run had all of the, I guess the, the, the hesitancy in you, when you see him going for it, you're like, Oh no, it's going to be like the, the, the touchdown in the Super Bowl That really wasn't a touchdown or maybe it was, we don't know, or it's going to be, you know, it's, he's going to come up just short and it's going to get overturned, but it didn't. And it wasn't, you know, they had good replay on this one. His knee was clearly not on the ground when the ball crossed the plane. It was, you know, and it, as you said, he's given up his body. He's doing what he needs to do to win. Um, I said this to uh, um, some guy, uh, some guys on Twitter uh, to a guy named Peter Underwood, who's a he's a big he's a big listener and uh, a good guy. I told him, I said, this is the kind of victory that can propel a team. It's the kind of win that can, you know, kind of focus them and cause them to come together. When I was talking to Antoine Randall L. Uh, last week, you know, we talked about the the Steelers game against the Bears when when their season was was falling apart, and and you know they had to win that game in the game in the snow where Bettis runs over Erlocker, turn their season around. Now the Steelers are not falling apart by no means, but you know they've had kind of a odd season and they've been on a roll, and this is the kind of game that keeps that going, and can bring a team together to move forward to a special kind of season. It's still early and they got a rough schedule coming up, but that's this kind of game. I mean, it just, it focuses you and it, and it makes you realize what you can do. I think. Yeah. I think, I think even more than that, you know, this shows that how close this team is as well. You know, I don't think there's many teams in the league that could face the type of type of adversity that they did dealt with uh, during this game. Um, Get rally and gather together and not crumble under the pressure with Mike Tomlin and the rest of the guys and come together and get that team win. Um, I mean, it was – you felt the emotion on the, by looking at the sidelines, seeing the guys on the field whenever Ben got that touchdown. You know, this is a lot closer of a locker room. I think a lot of people get uh, – that people realize. Um, a lot of people like to say the fact that, you know, it's a, it's a – it's a madhouse. There's no, you know, there's a lot of issues inside and whatnot. And all you always hear how the Steelers are just underplaying it. This is a team that's very close-knit. Um, this is a team that knows what it takes to win. They've been there. We've seen Ben do this in the past. We've seen AB do this in the past. Um, and realistically, for the rest of this gauntlet coming forward with some of these games left, um, this is a win that wasn't necessary to get, but it certainly helps you when it comes down to having games against the Saints left, the Patriots, the Chargers, having another division matchup with the Bengals. Like, this was a game that you didn't necessarily have to win. It wasn't going to ruin your season, but getting it certainly puts you in a better position and gives you, like you said, that confidence to move forward and kind of see where they can go. Because I would hate to go into the uh, the next couple weeks with this game in your mind saying, well, Ben didn't play a great game. You know, we let some mistakes get in the way of us. We let Leonard Fournette kind of run the ball earlier on. Um, this was definitely a good team win that's going to help get them that boost and maybe kind of give them that wake-up call that, you know, the Jaguars were one of the teams for whatever reason – um, the Steelers always seem to have some troubles getting over. Going into this game, Tomlin was only three and five in his career against the Jaguars, and those three wins, now four like this one, were all predominantly close games. Um, so the Steelers Jaguars have always kind of given us those physical matchups, and I think seeing them get that tough, gritty, hard nosed win like they did today, it can be that boost to maybe make the difference against a team like the Chargers or even the Patriots or Saints uh, when the time comes in the season. So there definitely is a maybe even their most important win of the season to date so far. Oh yeah, I, I think so. And I, you know, it's look, it's nice that the Ravens knocked the Bengals off, so that both of those teams are sitting at five and five, giving the Steelers a much more comfortable lead in the AFC North. But the bigger part of this is this keeps them ahead of the Patriots in yep. in the AFC race itself. They they maintain the number two seed. That is is something that I think is important. It, it also surprisingly enough because I didn't see this um, at the beginning of the year, but the the Texans are coming on big time. They're seven and three, keeps them ahead of them. Um, you know the Steelers will definitely benefit if they can keep you know at least it within the top two seeds as as we move forward. So it's a it's a big deal, uh, a great uh, lift for them going into another place where they don't play well often, which is Denver next week. 
Um, Mile High is not a place that they always seem comfortable playing in. They've had some great games there, uh, no, no doubt about it. I mean, they won an AFC championship there. But it does seem like regular season games and, and in in Denver are are problematic history wise. Um, anything else you uh, you want to bring up before we start to wrap this one up? I, I I still I'm looking at my Fitbit. My heart rate is still like 125. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I may need to go take a pill. But uh, you know, any, anything else you want to leave the listeners with? The only thing I can think of is just the fact that, you know, this wasn't a pretty game top to finish by any means. But uh, as I always like to point out in the NFL, there aren't style points. You know, we, I was talking to my buddies recently about um, you know, college football compared to this. You know, there's a lot of things that go into co- the college football rankings when it comes to where you're going to be when it comes to the, uh, the the college football playoffs. In the NFL, the only thing that matters is did you get that win or didn't you get that win? Um, that definitely – was the case today. The Steelers got the win they needed to do. Um, really kind of helps push them in the right direction. The streak remains alive. They've got six in a row now after people were riding them off beginning of September. They were already out of the playoffs in a lot of people's eyes. So, you know, the train keeps rolling along. It's a good win. There aren't style points in the NFL. I'll take a win any day of the week. Yeah. I, I, I'll close this out with a quote from Ben Roethlisberger, who said uh, that the Jaguars defense uh, does a lot of talking, but – I'm carrying the game ball home. <laughs> and that that's, in the end, you know what? An ugly win is a billion times prettier than a beautiful loss or any loss of any kind. Um, I will take it. Uh, they'll take it. Six wins in a row. Let's keep stacking them. And, uh, again, uh, Zach, thanks for joining us. Uh, appreciate you taking the time. Always a pleasure. Absolutely. So my name's Brian. His name's Zach. Uh, Everybody, until next time, remember, it's chaos out there. Be kind. We would like to thank you for listening and remind our listeners to follow us on social media and our website, www.steelcityunderground.com. 